Hello, my name's Dave Emery, and it's my privilege to present once again Christopher Simpson, the author of, among other, other titles, The Science of Coercion, Blowback, and the book that we're going to be speaking about today, The Splendid Blonde Beast, subtitled Money, Law, and Genocide in the 20th Century, published in softcover by the Common Courage Press. Chris, welcome back once again to our airwaves. Hello, Dave. Uh, your book is subtitled Money, Law, and Genocide in the 20th Century, and you begin your discussion of the relationship between those things with uh, a discussion of the Turkish genocide against the Armenians. Before getting into how that actually obtains with regard to the issue of war crimes per se, could you give us some historical background about that incident? Uh, well, briefly what happened is that uh, the Ottoman Empire, which, uh, which uh, ruled Turkey and also much of what is today uh, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and so forth, fabulously wealthy empire was falling apart uh, uh, during the end of the last century and the major European powers uh, wanted a piece of it uh, the Turkish government or, or Turkey which was the, the seat of that empire um, the sultan uh, was, uh, was weak and eventually overthrown by a, a military junta uh, these, uh, the, the junta took the name um, uh, Young Turks, and this expression is in our language today. Young Turks typically means somebody who is, who is um, cruel and um, an insurgent-type uh, uh, personality. Um, in any case, one of, the, one of the aspects of this particular rebellion was to try to hold the empi empire together in part by exterminating Armenians. Um, who uh, are a uh, nationality group in, in eastern Turkey. Uh, their ancestral home is uh, Mount Ararat uh, in eastern Turkey. And, um, oh, many of your listeners may have heard of, uh, of the book uh, 40 Days of Musadeh, uh, which is a, uh, an account of uh, the Armenian-Turkish conflict. Um, in any case, the, the so-called Young Turks set out to systematically exterminate Armenians, whom they interpreted as a, as a threat uh, during World War I. And um, they, they did this by, uh, first of all, uh, rounding up uh, the men in the villages and uh, putting them to uh, slave labor, uh, building railroads uh, mainly for German economic interests. Uh, and then seizing Armenian villages, seizing the women, the children, the surviving men, uh, and, and deporting them on forced marches uh, into what are uh, today the deserts of uh, northern Iraq and, and Syria, uh, and in the process killed uh, uh, at least a million people, even by the Turks' own estimates of, of, of the day, um, and some estimates run run twice as high. Uh, one of the one of the noteworthy things about this particular genocide is what's happening today, and that is is that the the Turkish government has for seventy years uh, systematically uh, denied the existence of this genocide, uh, despite proof from Turkey's own archives, um, and uh, you have a very large scale. Uh, publicity or propaganda campaign, you, you know, choose your own word, uh, to deny that a genocide took place. Uh, one of the, one of the characteristics of this propaganda campaign is, is that the Turkish government endows, um, university chairs and basically hires a big, a big, uh, gives a, a large pile of money to a university, um, who, uh, the, the strings that are attached to the money is, is that they have to hire a professor who, uh, who toes the line as far as the Turkish government's, uh, point of view on this question is concerned. Now, those strings are not written down. I mean, the, the, neither the universities nor the Turkish government is foolish enough to put that to paper, but, um, but that's, that's the substance of what is taking place. Uh, you mentioned, too, that with regard to uh, the influence of money on the administration of law towards genocide, that uh, a number of Western interests uh, saw to it that the, Tur the Turks were really not brought to justice for their crimes. And, and again, money uh, tended to affect law with regard to genocide. Right, right. I mean, part of the big idea, the overall idea of this book, is that uh, is, is looking at the development of international law 
as it pertains to war crimes and crimes against humanity. And genocide, of course, is a crime against humanity and, and arguably the most uh, uh, horrifying crime against humanity. Um, I, I argue in part that, first of all, um, the part of the engine that drives genocide, at least in some circumstances, is um, incentives that are uh, created by the genocidal government uh, that encourage ordinary people to persecute their neighbors uh, by basically by by stealing their their homes, uh, their farms, their shops, and so forth. You saw this phenomenon both in Turkey and later in Nazi Germany. So that's one aspect of of how money plays into this, and we can talk more about that if you wish. A second aspect of how money plays into this uh, is that as the international community attempts to articulate international law, right, come to agreement as to what international standards of conduct are, whether or not genocide is a crime, for example, as the international community attempts to do that, uh, money, wealth, uh, national security interests, uh, those types of factors play a very large role in the def uh, in defining law. Um, to we can take a brief sidetrack as is that you can see in in domestic law the way that uh, oh you'll have a uh, a regular t say say you have a, a industrial abuse of some sort uh, like. Uh, Oh, um, coming out of uh, uh, the United States in the last century, the the railroads were absolutely notorious for monopoly uh, uh, abuse and uh, and uh, systematically robbing farmers because uh, because they had uh, a monopoly on transportation. All right, well, so there was a big controversy, and the government eventually set up the Interstate Commerce Commission, and this was a reform. And the idea was that this new body, Interstate Commerce Commission was going to regulate the railroads in such a way that um, that the public interest would be protected. Um, so that's that's fine. Um, however, with, certainly within 20 years, uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission and uh, the uh, the railroads had grown so uh, interwoven with each other to, as to be practically indistinguishable. Um, what what I do in my book is to, uh, in the Splendid Blonde Beast, or part of what, what is discussed there, is how this same um, um, convergence of interests between the, between the crime and the law can take place on an international scale and can also take place uh, in, in extremely serious crimes that, that, would in in any um, usual sense of morality or ethics uh, be horrifying. Uh, if 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 you will permit me an example, I realize I've been been uh, going on uh, in in this particular uh, uh, vein for a moment, but but um, you can see it in international law concerning bombing of cities. Uh, now, as late as 1939, the President of the United States said that aerial bombing of an undefended city was a war crime, and that a country that, that did such a thing, um, uh, the, the, the commanders and so forth, should be put on trial for war crimes. This later, of course, helped to uh, dampen the appetites of some U.S. officials to put Nazi uh, war criminals on trial in World War II for fear of reprisal against some of our own airmen. Well, that's true. That's true. I think more fundamentally what you see coming out of World War II uh, is that um, the Nazi style of genocide with the, with the gas chambers and the, and the horrifying roundups and the, uh, the, the, uh, the terrible uh, mass murder at the edge of the ditch that kind of genocide was clearly condemned, and, and um, uh, the world uh, at large acknowledges that that's a crime. The different type of mass murder, 
namely dropping bombs on cities or dropping missiles on cities, which is much the same thing, was not only not criminalized, it actually became the foundation of the national security strategy of both the United States and eventually the Soviet Union as, as well. So one type of mass murder becomes criminal, and a different type of mass murder becomes institutionalized. And so, so part of the book looks at how that phenomena comes to pass. Uh, something that I'd like to uh, talk about in terms of the development uh, of how money specifically influenced uh, the development of international law uh, concerns something that you talk about on page 46, and I'd like to read a couple of sentences and then have you uh, ex explain and develop this further here. On page 46 you write, during the 1970s crisis, talking about uh, the uh, crisis with regard to oil in the 1970s, actually let me start a couple of sentences up. The United States had emerged from World War I with its currency and industry stronger than ever before, at least as long as Britain and other debtors continued to pay their bills. The 1920s boom, driven by imperialism, cheap oil, and the emerging automobile economy in the U.S. created enormous pools of investment funds in the banks of New York and Boston. This led to an international financial situation that was similar in some respects to the Middle East oil crisis of the 1970s. During the 1970s crisis, the central problem from the standpoint of international finance was to recycle the massive pools of funds that had shifted to the Middle East back to the international banking network in order to stave off a string of bankruptcies that would otherwise have resulted from illiquidity in the system. During the 1970s, most of this recycling was carried out through the euro-dollar market. During the second half of the 1920s, the most important international market for recycling the new private U.S. wealth was Germany. I realize this is a tall order, Chris, but if you could explain briefly the euro-dollar situation and then how that related to the U.S. and German situation in the 1920s. Right, right, in soundbite uh, in sound bite form of uh, 30 seconds or less. Sure. Um, I mean, this, this is the part of, part of the difficulty with any kind of discussion like this, and and really, part of the difficulty with media is how does one uh, explain the uh, the complexity, the the real world complexity of history, when almost all of the conversation has to be reduced to to sentences that are you know six or seven words long. Oh, understood. It's just that this particular connection is so central to the sure. development of your thesis. Right, right. I, you know, I'm not trying to uh, to uh, uh, you know, dump on you, Dave. I'm, I'm, I'm. What I'm trying to get at is that, is that as a society, we've got a um, a problem with in which our our very misunderstanding, our, our our the very myths by which we live, are to a certain extent structurally built in to the way that we communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, on the banking question. Well, I, I think we can we can do uh, even more contemporary than than the uh, 1970s uh, euro dollar crisis, and that is uh, what's going on today sure. with uh, with international finance. And um, the situation is somewhat different today for for a whole string of reasons. But but the the element of similarity is this uh, that mm, banks. Uh, lend money to each other. They lend money to businesses, and uh, this is how you know uh, finance works. Uh, fine, as long as the money keeps flowing, as long as it keeps moving around. Well, then uh, you know everybody who wears uh, a, uh, a suit to work uh, goes home at night and uh, sleeps uh, in peace. Um, what I'm trying to say is is that the the system has the appearance of efficiency. It has the appearance of of operating well. But what happens when uh, either because of a of a crisis in in the ability of of companies to pay back their loans, or a glut, a a kind of a clog, or if you if not to be too crude about it, it's sort of a form of of economic constipation sets in, in which the money doesn't doesn't flow through the system in the same way, and what happens then is that you get a string of bankruptcies, one 
sort of falls against the next, against the next, against the next. And that is what we've been seeing uh, over the last uh, at least two years now, um, starting with a, with a very little noticed and practically unreported uh, series of bankruptcies in uh, Thailand, and then that's spreading through Asia and then into uh, into um, uh, Russia and uh, into South America and increasingly into Europe. Uh, in Canada, for example, has been suffering from this for some time, and, and so forth and so on. Um, and uh, so the point being is is that illiquidity, that's the term, uh, a clogging up of the circulation of uh, capital, money, um, brings the system to a halt. Uh, now, in the 1970s crisis, what happened was is that OPEC for a few years was extremely effective. And the uh, jump in the price of oil meant that huge pools of money ended up in the hands of particularly Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, and several other countries. Um, the and, and there was a very real uh, threat or concern at the time that the whole international banking system would come unraveled because the Saudis couldn't spend their money fast enough to keep the to keep the capital circulating through banks around the world. Um, so the euro dollar, which hadn't previously existed, uh, was is a capital market in which U.S. dollars are bought and sold and lent and traded and invested in. Um, uh, in uh, using European currencies and uh, serving primarily European or international customers. And so this was the way that the log jam was broken. Now, the, the bankers in your audience will, will point out that that's a pretty large oversimplification of, of what took place, and, and it is. But, but, the, but the basic point is found, is, is that when the financial system becomes clogged that way, it comes apart, it unravels. It shuts itself down, and uh, so that unless there is a, a means to break that that logjam, then there's there's a economic crisis that can spread worldwide. Now, in the 1920s, you had somewhat the same situation. The Americans had participated in World War One at the very end, and uh, uh, the you know, despite all the patriotic songs and all of that, I and mean, the number of casualties among the American forces were were really quite low. There was uh, no uh, damage to the American industrial base, and uh, uh, both the American banks and uh, companies came out of the war uh, very much ahead of where they had been previously. Before the war, America... While it was powerful and particularly powerful in Central America, uh, was uh, second, third, or fourth place, well behind uh, the uh, uh, United Kingdom as far as world empires was concerned, well behind the French, um, arguably behind the Germans as well. I mean, a big part of what was going on in World War One is, is that the Germans. Had had decided that they wanted an empire like the like the uh, British and couldn't see any reason why they shouldn't have it and uh, went to war to get it. I'm I'm plopped under zone basically, a place in the sun. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but uh, as things happened and as things happened with imperial wars, number one, the main price was not paid by the by the people who put the you know who set the war off. The main price was paid by ordinary people, both in terms of blood and in terms of dollars. Uh, and number two, um, the the empires were enormously weakened. Uh, the Russian Empire, uh, the Tsarist system, was overthrown. There was a there was a communist revolution. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had been previously weakened, uh, came to an end. And there was very near, nearly a communist revolution in uh, Hungary and in uh, Germany. Uh, the uh, Germany uh, was um, 
deeply uh, transformed by World War I for obvious reasons. Even England, the, the, the ostensible victor in the war, uh, only came to victory by doing what? By borrowing money from the Americans. In the same way with the French, borrowing money from the Americans. Um, now, meanwhile, Germany was the enemy, so they weren't borrowing money from the Americans, but when they lost the war, the British and the French and other powers went to Germany and said, you have committed, and said with some justice, by the way, you have committed war crimes against our people, you've destroyed our uh, ships and planes and homes, well, not planes, but ships and homes and hospitals and so forth, and therefore you must pay war damages. Uh, and they, they haggled over the, over the price tag for this. But, um, when, when the haggling was over, it came down to something on the order of $25 billion. Now, where were the Germans going to get this sort of, uh, money? Um, the, the first thing that they tried to do was through a, uh, a system that amounted uh, in in essence, to simply printing new uh, Reichsmarks, printing new currency, uh, and then using that to pay the uh, the reparations, uh, and that and the result of that was the the uh, well known uh, German uh, inflation crisis of the 1920s, where people were, you know, pushing around the German banknotes in wheelbarrows in order to do their their grocery shopping. Um, uh, meanwhile, the ostensible victors of the war, they were trying to, they had obligations to pay their bills too. And so what they would do is, is they would try to get reparations from Germany and then take that, those reparations and then pay the bills to the American banks and in that way keep this cycle of capital moving, keep it revolving in the same sense that we see in, in we were speaking of just a, you know, a few moments ago about uh, the 1970s problem or the 1990s problem well the uh, uh, when it came around to um, uh, repaying the Americans what was happening were, were big clogs of money in the banks in New York and in Boston in somewhat the same way we saw in the the big clogs of money in the Middle East after the after the uh, jump in oil prices. So, what were they going to do with this money? How were they going to invest it in? You know, I mean, this is a this is a capitalist system. They have to to turn the money around. They have to make money with money, in order for the system to continue to continue turning over, so to speak. Uh, the engine continue to turn it over, uh, to to use a, a metaphor. And uh, what they did with it primarily was a system by which they took the money from the American banks and lent it back to the Germans, who then used it to uh, do what amounted to, um, well, they did some city reconstruction with it, of, of cities that had been damaged by the war. But even more, what they did was what would today be called leverage buyouts, uh, where a, a German entrepreneur, Frederick Flick, uh, to name only one example, would get cheap money from the Americans and buy his competitors in the steel and coal and uh, iron business and build himself up into sort of the Bill Gates or the Lee Iacocca of, of that particular era. Um, and then, and then he, you know, would, would be forced to, to come up with some means of of paying back those loans, and much of that he took out of the out of the hides of the people uh, uh, who who worked for the coal and steel industries that he had that he had bought. Um, so to to you know to 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 sort of sum up all this, when you when you've got a um, perhaps it applies to any sort of international economic system, but it certainly applies to a an uh, international economic system that is built on capitalism in the sense of capital moving uh, to be invested and to, to make profit on capital. Um, when it gets clogged up, it breaks down. The system breaks down. 
And when the system breaks down, it causes a big crisis. When the first thing that that the you know these sort of masters of industry, the the bankers and so forth, try to do is to figure out a way to profitably reinvest it to keep the system from breaking down. I, I happen to uh, live and work in Washington D.C. and uh, not long ago there was a there were uh, big meetings of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund trying to figure out what the heck to do with the uh, with the world uh, economic crisis as it exists today. You've never seen so many limousines in your life. Uh, the the uh, the city was uh, particularly the the major hotels was absolutely wall to wall with uh, with uh, limousines and and people who. Supposedly, are are concerned with uh, dealing with uh, with uh, curing international poverty and these sort of things, but who whose personal lifestyles is, tend to be extremely opulent. Um, uh, trying to figure out what to do with with the current clogging up or the current constipation, if you will, of the international monetary system. Uh, and not surprisingly, they they have at least so far they do not appear to have succeeded at their task. Uh, we're going to be talking about how uh, this, how the recapitalization of Germany in the 1920s by some of the top institutions and some of the top individuals associated with the Wall Street elite uh, obtained uh, on the issue of genocide and specifically how later. Uh, some of these same figures came to see the prosecution of Nazi war crimes as uh, uh, a poor idea under the circumstances of realpolitik that obtained at the time. We're going to deal with that, however, in our next half hour. We've been speaking with Christopher Simpson, the author of, among other titles, The Science of Coercion Blowback, The Splendid Blonde Beast, which we've been talking about. And, Chris, you have a new title that's just out in which you've edited uh, works about uh, the universities and empire. Yeah, yeah, it, it deals with it deals with where ideas come from. It deals with how intellectuals work in uh, modern societies. And it, it's, it's titled very quickly because we're almost out of time. Universities and Empire by the New Press from New York, hardcover. And uh, we will be dealing with that in a future broadcast. But uh, in our next uh, half hour, we're going to get to the subject of how some of these events obtained on uh, events that uh, not only uh, related to World War II, but had a profound influence on the course of the Cold War. For Christopher Simpson, this is Dave Emery saying thanks for listening. Hello, my name's Dave Emery, and it's my privilege once again to present Christopher Simpson, the author of, among other titles, Blowback, The Science of Coercion, and uh, the book that we're speaking about today, The Splendid Blonde Beast, subtitled Money, Law, and Genocide in the 20th Century, published in softcover by the Common Courage Press and copyright 1995. Chris, welcome back once again to our airwaves. Hello, Dave. In our last half hour, we were talking about the recapitalization of Germany in the 1920s by American financial institutions to a considerable extent in order to keep the international financial capital, international capital flows uh, going. I'd like to talk about some of the institutions and individuals that were central to not only that recapitalization but a lot of subsequent events that you talk about. Let's start with Sullivan and Cromwell and the uh, D- the brothers Dulles, Allen and uh, John yeah, Foster. the brothers Dulles. Well, the the so uh, the conclusion that we we left off with was that um, that if the international financial flow of capital becomes clogged up then the whole system breaks down well then the next question is is well sort of is is who's in charge of of the plumbing you know who 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 keeps it uh, who keeps the plumbing open um, and uh, the fact is is that particularly during the 1920s you had a really quite small number of people who specialized in this particular task we're talking about fewer than 200 people worldwide who were uh, international lawyers, uh, uh, senior executives of of, um, of uh, national banks of a handful of powerful countries, and so on. Sullivan and Cromwell was a law firm in New York, is a law firm in New York, it remains very powerful today, um, that uh, specialized in putting together international deals and, and had sort of pioneered this whole concept of a of a um, multinational corporation back in the mid uh, 1900s. Um, a- after World War One, what happened was that uh, John Foster Dulles was a lawyer, but uh, he was also a, a banker, and um, 
his uh, uncle was Secretary of State, and his, his uh, you know, other relatives were very well placed, and and so on. And uh, as things came to pass, Dulles uh, was on the American uh, negotiating team that uh, that put together the settlement, uh, the financial settlement, at the end of World War One. I'm talking about John Foster Dulles now. These this were the, the elder brother, and these ultimately le- yielded the Dawes and Young plan. Exactly, exactly, and. And as we spoke before, uh, the first thing that that uh, the first attempt to to resolve who was going to pay for World War One um, led to the German uh, inflation crisis of the early 1920s, uh, which very nearly set off a, a new uh, world war just by itself. Um, what uh, John Foster Dulles put together with a number of, of uh, other bankers was a system by which the, the the Germans would borrow money to repay the loans to uh, England and so forth, which would then take that money and repay the loans to the Americans, who in turn would lend it to the Germans, and who in turn would pay back the British, who would pay back the Americans, who would lend it to the Germans. And, and you see the how the cycle works. And as long as the cycle continues... John Foster Dulles was seen as, as you know, the uh, the visionary uh, uh, captain of uh, of world finance. Um, Dulles and a handful of others, uh, Paul Nitze, who who is um, uh, was later to to reemerge in in during the Cold War as a very important American uh, Cold Warrior, sort of realpolitik. Uh, uh, advisor to uh, a half a dozen American presidents. John Foster Dulles ended up as Secretary of State. His uh, his brother Allen ended up as at the same time as um, as Director of the CIA. Uh, the uh, uh, several of the of the main financial empires that Dulles served. Uh, his family was wealthy in its own right, but but his real job was was serving. The the ultra rich, the Harrimans, for example, the Rockefellers, and so on, um, and uh, these really quite small circles uh, work together to to recapitalize Germany, to to uh, you know to 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 profit off of the the Roaring Twenties boom. Uh, of uh, of that time um, now and and they set up a variety of different plans that that uh, ended up uh, taking advantage of uh, of small investors when the bottom fell out of the market in 1929 but that's kind of another story as far as what happened with germany is concerned is that you had a had a half a dozen or so of these early multinational corporations. I mean, the idea of a multinational corporation in a world where where um, transportation is slow and making a cross-country telephone call is almost impossible, a multinational corporation in that kind of circumstances is, um, is quite an undertaking. Um, in the 1920s and 1930s, what it led to was a half a dozen or so multinational corporations that bound together the financial elite of Wall Street on the one hand with the financial elite of Germany on the other. And uh, this was a, a uh, this is a very well-documented um, uh, process. It's, there's nothing conspiratorial about it in, in the sense of, uh, you know, some, some um, you know, kind of vast... Uh, uh, you know, Illuminati banker or Jewish quote unquote conspiracy type oh, no, uh, story. No, there was it, nothing. There was nothing occult about this. This was one of the major capital phenomena. Right, of the early I mean, it, it's how the century. system works. It's, right. it's how the system works. And far from being a Jewish banking conspiracy, as we're about to see, this ultimately led to the uh, concretization of the exact opposite force. Exactly. Exactly. It. It. it one of the. It, this was this ended up as a contributing factor to the Holocaust, and here's why: is that part of the one of the most important questions at the end of World War One was what is a crime against humanity? What is a war crime? And the reason that was important, of course, is the moral question. 
uh, and is also the, the fact that at the end of World War I that ordinary people were, were more and more involved in the, in the life and, uh, and the democratic character of their countries than ever before in history, and because it's, it was very expensive. Because all of the players agreed that if a country had committed a war crime, then it was responsible for paying some form of reparation for that crime. So the definition of what a war crime was, or the definition of what a crime against humanity was, became an economic question, in addition to being a legal question and a moral question. People like John Foster Dulles, and and uh, oh, uh, his brother Alan, for example. well, his brother Alan, yes, and perhaps as many as two dozen other people, had a very strong interest in limiting the definition of war crime to the maximum degree possible, and ob- obliterating, canceling, refusing to acknowledge that there was such a thing as a crime against humanity. Um, why? It's because uh, because of the financial interests of the of the institutions that they represented for for reasons that we've been discussing for a while, and in the particular case of the crime against humanity, um, there was concern, and they they wrote it down quite explicitly in in diaries and so forth, that uh, that if, for example, the Turkish attempt to exterminate the Armenians was recognized as a crime, as it certainly should have been, and in fact, as the Americans had promised that it would be during the war, that once, if this was recognized at the end of the war, once the war propaganda was over, then it was quite likely that the Americans themselves would find themselves in the dock for a crime against humanity in connection with slavery, with the the, uh, extermination of indigenous peoples, with uh, the uh, their role in the mass murders in the Philippines at the turn of the century, and a whole list of other of uh, other um, uh, offenses that uh, I imagine your your listeners are familiar with. Um, so the John Foster Dulleses of the world, and and again we're talking about a very small number of people here, uh, had a great interest in limiting the definition of these crimes. So when Hitler came to power. And when the extermination of the, you know, the first things that he did uh, as far as uh, persecution of Jews uh, were dispossessing Jews, taking away their property, taking away their ability to make a living. Um, Petty persecution, petty, quote-unquote, in the sense of um, uh, expelling them from schools or from professions, beating them up, that type of thing. And those are serious crimes, uh, yet they are of a different order than, than mass murder. Um, as the Nazi state moved from this quote-unquote petty form of, of persecution, which was evil enough, into an exterminationist form of persecution, then this was, this was a relatively public event. I mean, people who were reading European newspapers or reading German newspapers had a pretty good idea of what was going on. Um, and so the question came up in, in, uh, in the uh, legal advisor's office of the U.S. State Department, legal advisor's office in the foreign, foreign office of, uh, of uh, the United Kingdom. Well, are we going to intervene as Nazi Germany deports uh, certain categories of people to uh, concentration camps, which are, by evidence already in our hands, actually death centers where people um, are starved to death or left to die from the elements. Now, this is before the gas chambers. And the answer that the lawyers came back with was, no, we're not going to intervene. We're not going to... to to uh, get involved in this. Why? It's because it's not illegal. There's no such thing as a crime against humanity. We decided that at, at the end of World War I. If Hitler wants to treat his people like that, well, then maybe Hitler's a distasteful person, but he's not doing anything against the law. 
this was the the reasoning at the time. I'm not trying to defend this. I'm simply trying to articulate what the story was or what the claim was at the time. This uh, line of argument centered on a group of State Department uh, functionaries who could be said to be sort of a uh, correlating element to some of the Wall Street elite that we were speaking about earlier, the brothers Dulles and so oh, forth. Absolutely, and absolutely. They, they were very much intertwined with each other. And, and once again, this is not like some sort of Illuminati conspiracy BS. I mean, this... It, you take you you can sit down and and look at the foreign uh, uh, you know the the staffs of of uh, the state state the foreign service of the of the United States State Department and and the you know the kind of the the graduate list from Princeton and and uh, the the lawyers from uh, Wall Street and and so forth and see enormous uh, familial overlap people moving through revolving door type jobs and so forth. We're, we're it, talking, by the way, about the Regia faction within the State Department, and I think a better way of understanding how they function is to uh, substitute the term networking for a conspiracy. Sure, sure. Networking is a way to to look at it. In, in a certain, in, in in one way, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, if if there's only a handful, if there's a relative handful of people on Wall Street who are used to dealing with Germans. And with the German economy and no, no up from down as far as various parts of Europe are concerned, then it's not surprising that the, that some of those same folks will end up, at least in some administrations, in posts where they're representing the U.S. government in dealing with Europe. And in fact, somewhat the same phenomena it, it continues to this day. Sure. Um, at that time, it was particularly intense and particularly inbred and particularly small and tight circles, uh, in part because, in a metaphorical sense, the world was a smaller place in those days. Uh, so that r- rather than having kind of a, uh, you know, sort of a, a stratum of people doing these jobs, you really had a, a country club full of these people doing these jobs, and that was about it. Um, to, but to get back to the genocide question, they had defined war crime in a certain way at the end of World War I, mainly uh, because it was profitable uh, for them to do it that way. And they had refused, in the face of great popular outcry at the time, to accept the, to recognize that uh, there was such a thing as a crime against humanity, such a thing as a crime which a government commits against its own citizens, for example. That's one type of crime against humanity. Such a thing as genocide or a, a, uh, a crime in which a state sets out to exterminate an entire people, even though they had seen that with their own eyes in the Turkish attempt to exterminate the Armenians, and even though they had documented that with you know in, in their own archives again in the turkish attempt to exterminate the Ar- armenians from a legal standpoint that uh, crime was said not to exist so that when hitler came along his uh, ability to first of all set the the foundation for mass extermination of jews and and eventually of other peoples as well and to begin the process of that extermination was uh, it was it was shored up it was helped out uh, it's not too much to say by people particularly in the in the legal advisors offices of the of the state departments and foreign ministries that said hands off don't get involved this is none of our business this is the, there's no basis in international law to to even make a protest over this, um, and that that theory of how international law should work remained the dominant theory, um, you know, uh, certainly up till uh, the International Tribunal at Nuremberg, and and continues to be felt in in a variety of ways to this day. A couple of uh, sentences that I'd like to read about the uh, uh, political philosophy of the Regia group, who again were sort of a State Department uh, element that corresponded to uh, some of the Wall Street operators that we alluded to earlier. On page 52 of the paperback edition, you write, uh, 
More to the point here, however, is the Riga Group's impact on U.S.-German relations, particularly after Hitler came to power. Perhaps the most influential proponent of the Riga axioms inside the government during the Roosevelt years was FDR's first ambassador to Moscow, William Bullitt. By the way, that's with two L's, an I, and two T's. He had arrived in the USSR full of enthusiasm for normalized U.S.-Soviet relations, but he felt soon after convinced, quote, that only Nazi Germany could stay the advance of Soviet Bolshevism into Europe, unquote, uh, a view that was uh, shared by others, such as uh, people like Robert Murphy. And then later you write, again, of the same type of faction and their attitudes towards uh, war crimes uh, with regard to the Germans' use of slave labor. Quote, for them, forced labor seemed little more than a particularly harsh solution to problems that were common to U.S. and German elites. Chris, we've got uh, just about ten minutes left in the interview, and I'd like to uh, develop those points a little further and talk about how people like Robert Murphy, George Keenan uh, of that Riga faction, and later people like Alan Dulles and William Draper uh, came to be involved with seeing uh, to the reconstruction of Germany after World War II and affected a situation not unlike what had happened after World War I. Right, right. Well, um, again, it, I realize this is a tall order for 10 sure, minutes. Right. Sure. I mean, we were talking earlier about how quite a number of empires came to an end during World War I, and one of them, of course, was that of Tsarist Russia whose government was overthrown by a, a communist revolution. Um, now, the uh, the big uh, capitalists, uh, the big uh, business, uh, the social leaders, the chambers of commerce and so forth, um, were appalled by this development. It's because this kind of class-based uh, struggle uh, had been a characteristic of America for for. 40, 50 years at that point. The uh, IWW, the Wobblies, uh, were a potent political force in the United States at that time. Uh, the, uh, the labor unions were, in many cases, virtually illegal in the United States. And, uh, and along comes a, a, a movement that says labor should rule. Well, so the, the U.S. government was, was not happy with, with this. Um, so you had growing in the State Department a particular analysis um, of how do you respond to Bolshevik Russia? What do you do with them? Um, and you had some people who favored uh, dealing with uh, Soviet Russia more or less as a conventional power and, um, and establishing more or less conventional uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, and you had others whose uh, uh, strategy was to to systematically undermine and uh, attempt to overthrow that particular government. Um, the The latter group were were called the uh, Riga or the Riga faction. That particular term was uh, coined by a very uh, mainstream uh, American historian, Daniel Jurgen, who wrote a a, uh, a uh, quite a uh, good uh, study of, of the emergence of this group. Okay, well, so who was in this group? Well, you had people who, like George Kennan, who is with us today, who, who remains the, the big deal, you know, the so-called wise man that, uh, that uh, were very influential in U.S.-Soviet policy after 1945. Someone you write extensively about in blowback, too. Sure, sure. Uh, Robert Murphy, who was... Uh, um, assistant Secretary of State, and uh, under oh, three or four different presidential administrations, and at one point was a uh, acting Secretary of State, and so on. A man very influential as far as uh, U.S. Uh, uh, international relations are concerned, um, and and a core group of of more or less similar thinking people um, in in the State Department whose specialty was dealing with Eastern Europe. Um, and Bullitt, uh, as as you read, was one of them. And Bullitt at, uh, was sent to uh, when Roosevelt came to power. One of the things that he did is, was that what was to uh, attempt to reopen rational or more or less conventional diplomatic relations with the Soviets. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> it was a particularly hard time to do that. It's because, for one thing, the United States was in an e economic crisis. For another thing, the Soviet Union was in the midst of a, uh, 
was uh, of a major uh, land uh, and uh, class uh, upsurge, which uh, in the end uh, turned uh, rather bloody in quite a number of places. Uh, Stalin was solidifying his power and, you know, so forth and so on. So creating normal diplomatic relations was not a particularly easy job. On top of that, the revolutionary core that that had brought the communists to power, or the revolutionary ideals, put it that way, that the communists had been able to to articulate, and on that basis to win power and win popular support, they they had yet to to turn sour in the minds of of, uh, of many people, and uh, so literally millions of people around the world looked to the Soviet Union as the model of a new society, a new world, a, a, a better way of life, and so forth and so on. Now. You know, the, there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then, and, and uh, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> In fact, I'm quite sure that, that that's, uh, that's not the way uh, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union doesn't even exist anymore. Um, but, uh, but the point is, is, is that at that time, it, that was the way it appeared. So when Bullitt went there, Bullitt was very much a, a son of the, of the ruling class, a ruling elite, however you want to put it. Um, he went there as Roosevelt's emissary with an idea of establishing more or less rational relations with the Soviets. And then he returned uh, literally within months saying that the only, uh, the only thing to do with the Soviets was to encourage the Nazis to go to war with them. Uh, and, uh, and that particular trend of thinking remained um, entrenched and dominant, really, in the U.S. State Department uh, th- throughout the 1930s, throughout Hitler's rise and throughout Hitler's consolidation of power. You mentioned that uh, d- there was a struggle within the U.S. State Department between this uh, Riga faction. Uh, is it pronounced Riga or Riga? Uh, Riga is, is, uh, is the correct the, pronunciation. Anyway, yeah. the Riga faction and uh, those who were attempting to administer... Uh, the policy that had actually been uh, the policies that had been enunciated by people like Franklin Roosevelt. Right. Uh, ultimately, the Robert Murphys and the Riga faction prevailed. And you mentioned that, with regard to the administration of intelligence in Germany, uh, Alan Dulles of Sullivan and Cromwell, who, had, who was working for OSS, uh, became the primary U.S. functionary. And at the same time, another member of this uh, Wall Street elite, who was wearing an, uh, uh, another national security hat. William Draper of Dylan Reed uh, became a key U.S. official with regard to uh, frustrating the decarbonization of Germany. Uh, in our last couple of minutes, I wonder if you could, uh, as, as briefly as possible, detail that for us, bearing in mind right. the, the impossibility of really doing that justice. Okay, well, I mean, basically what you had happen is that what we've been seeing so far is, is the emergence of this small, uh, relatively small circle of people who specialized in U.S.-German relations, and and also in this kind of triangular relationship between the United States, Germany, and the Soviet Union. Uh, and those three relationships were uh, really uh, very important as far as American foreign policy for Europe was concerned throughout the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and so on. And And we're talking about a relative handful of people who make the decisions about what's going to be done there. Uh, the, the ones who were making the decisions in the 1920s about banking and investment were, by the 1940s, the ones who were in charge of the, um, uh, in some cases, in, in charge of parts of the American war effort against uh, the Nazi government. And then, after Hitler was gone, in charge of the American occupation of Germany, when all of the very complicated uh, questions involving how do you denazify a country that has been a Nazi uh, country, an enthusiastic, uh, by the way, Nazi country for, for almost two decades, how do you denazify that sort of situation? 
How do you reconstruct Germany? How do you put a country back on its feet so it can survive economically? And so forth and so on. These are, these are not easy questions to answer. And the, the, the ones who had the appearance of being experts at answering these questions were precisely the ones who had been personally involved in creating the economic and political conditions that had led to, to Hitler's rise to power who had participated in business deals with major German companies during Hitler's uh, rule, and who in many cases had personal or familial um, economic interests in companies that, that were profiting from Germany's reconstruction. Uh, William Draper is uh, one example that you use. Um, and he, by the way, was a, we're, we're almost out of time. He was a, a general uh, at the end of the war, and he had been a key official with Dylan Reed, in helping to uh, promote U.S. investment in Germany. And uh, then, as I said, uh, Alan Dulles from Sullivan and Cromwell sure, had a lot sure. to do with administering uh, intelligence matters. And, of course, Alan Dulles and people like George Kennan and others uh, figure prominently in uh, your book, Blowback, which uh, follows in many ways on the work that you did in Splendid Blonde Beast. Uh, we've been speaking with Christopher Simpson, uh, the author of the vitally important book, The Splendid Blonde Beast, Money, Law, and Genocide in the 20th Century, published in softcover by Common Courage Press, copyright 1995. Chris, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Dave. And for Christopher Simpson, this is Dave Emery saying thanks for listening.